everyone. My name is Anna Heck. I work at Michigan State University. I'm our Apiculture Extension Educator, and I'm really excited about tonight's webinar, Large Scale Pollinator Habitat Through the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund CETA Legacy Program. So I'm here with Jeremy Rhodes and Elsa Gallagher. Uh, Jeremy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Jeremy Rhodes. Um, I'm going to be presenting the uh, the case study for this program. I pretty much was where you guys were a couple of years ago uh, with trying to figure out exactly what we needed to do uh, to get a pollinator habitat going. So pretty excited uh, to share our progress over the last couple of years. Thank you. And Elsa? Yes, uh, my name is Elsa Gallagher and I work for the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And my, my main program is the Seed Legacy Program but I'm the Habitat uh, Program Director for uh, a host of different programs that we have at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. But tonight we're gonna focus on how you can get a CETA Legacy Project started on your own ground. And yeah. we'll be here to answer any questions for you from, from Jeremy from his project and then me from the many projects I work with uh, across the US. All right, so I'm gonna get started with some resources and staying connected. Then Jeremy is going to talk about his experience in the program. And finally, Elsa is going to talk about the program. So uh, this webinar it comes from this, um, a lot of people being really interested in pollinator habitat, especially large scale pollinator habitat. I work a lot with bees and people are always asking me, how can I help the bees? And I always try to tell them to plant flowers for bees. And this is one way if you have lots of land to uh, put it into pollinator habitat. So we're really excited about showing you this example or case study. Um, we do um, have a lot of resources on pollinator planting on our website. So if you go to uh, pollinators.msu.edu, that brings you to our website. And we have a section on planting for pollinators and especially large scale pollinator habitat. So what we're talking about tonight is just one program and one example. There's lots of ways to install large scale pollinator habitat and lots of programs, uh, but this is the one that we've decided to highlight tonight as an example for everyone. All right, so next I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy to talk about his experience uh, installing pollinator habitat and working with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Okay, so <clears throat> um, again, my name is Jeremy Rhodes. Um, a little bit about me, I'm uh, married with uh, two young kids. We live in Northern Macomb County, about an hour away from Detroit. Um, I work in the mod automotive industry, so I really don't have any affiliation with any anybody else, MSU, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Um, I'm not a farmer. Um, I'm not a expert with pollinator habitat. So I relied heavily on Elsa and her crew uh, when going through this entire process. So. Um, I was actually in the same position that everybody else is uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I'm an amateur beekeeper. Uh, it's kind of like a little hobby job for us. My wife and I run it, a little business called J2B Farm. Uh, we do honey and lip balm and candles and things like that. So uh, with the area that we're in, we're in a very agricultural area in Northern Macomb County. And my bees have access to a lot of the weeds and things like that in the area. Uh, there's heavy farming in this area. So they're constantly rotating soybeans and corn, uh, winter wheat. Those are the three big products that we have um, around this area. So the ultimate goal um, for me, at least, was to give my bees and pollinator, uh, the local pollinators and wildlife in the area, kind of a refuge where they could go that was untouched. Um, we did, and I'll show you pictures of our, our, of our property. So we're on 11 acres. Uh, part of it's our home. A part of it we were leasing out uh, as agricultural land. So we had a farmer that was consistently rotating crops through it. And then part of it is woods. Um, you know, with, with the chemicals and things that they're spraying now, I wanted to reduce the amount of pesticide that was being at least used around our home. I know five acres is probably not that much, and that's exactly what we're using for our pollinator habitat, but it's it's still something. Uh, without the farming, the five acres, I would have had to maintain it. So one of the things was when I was looking for uh, to install a pollinator habitat, it was to, to reduce the amount of maintenance that I had on that five acres. And then of course, with me being a beekeeper, uh, the increase in honey production um, and having a 
food source for pollen and nectar for my bees going through the spring all the way through the fall was a big thing for me. So what I started doing was when I was interested in getting into a pollinator habitat was I went to Google. I started searching for what I needed to do, you know, native plants in the area, um, how much it was for, for the seed. And it got to be a little bit overwhelming. I mean, where we're at in Michigan, uh, it differs from Ohio and Indiana and any, anywhere around us. And then the seed costs are astronomical. Um, I think we were looking at $1,000 per acre for seed. And with us having five acres, it would have cost me five grand. So it was actually a social media post that I uh, found on Facebook that somebody had pointed out the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And I clicked on it, started investigating the Seed Legacy program, um, I actually sent Elsa an email prior to even applying for it, uh, just to find out exactly uh, how the program worked and what I needed to do, and then just decided to go for it. So I'm going to walk you through the timeline of exactly what our property looked like, uh, and then take you through the progression of what we needed to do before we seeded, and then the progression of what the habitats actually looked like. So when we started looking for property, um, we ended up finding the parcel that we we're at. We're on 11 acres. You can see here from the picture that it was all ag. And I mean, if you look around, it's all farmland. So the farmer that was actually farming the property was on a corn rotation. Um, and typically, like I said, what they'll do is they'll cycle through corn, soybeans, uh, winter wheat. Um, and that's just to keep the nitrogen levels in the soil you know, up because the plants use different, uh, different nutrients. This is another shot of what the property looked like. Now, mind you, our house is, we built a house, so there's a house on this property now, so it looks a lot different than it looks now. The following year, uh, what they had to do was in 2015, we had a really wet year, so they weren't able to actually get soybeans down, so they put in winter wheat, which is what we're showing here. So our culvert went in, and our property's got winter wheat on it. So in order to, with us living on farmland, um, it was very flat. So I needed to do a significant amount of work to try to manage water. So what we're looking at here is this, the first spring that we had lived here. This was after the snow melt. And you can see the amount of water that we had pulled up. If I actually go back and look at aerial photos of our property uh, on Google, you can actually see this specific area was really, really wet. Uh, so I, I had to go through and do uh, some, some moving of dirt. We had to actually strip a couple inches of topsoil off the back of our property and pull it up to our house to grade it out a little bit better. And you're going to see in some of these pictures, you can see that I still have, I have grass. I actually seeded it. Um, we actually had to, to pull dirt over the seed, but I needed to manage this water. I needed to get it to move to the sides of the property. So I don't know if some people know what swales are. Swales are just a very shallow ditch. Um, this is a picture of me and my little daughter out on the tractor. Um, I will say the one thing, and, and most of you are probably looking at a little bit of a larger scale uh, piece of property. Um, I did need a tractor. So that's our tractor. You know, I've got access to a box blade, rotary cutter, uh, you know, back blade. So a lot of what you're seeing here I did myself with equipment that I did own. So we put probably 70 to 80 hours worth of work into managing the water, getting the water out to the edges of the property uh, just to keep everything kind of high and dry. It's just an image from the tractor. You can kind of see the swale there. Uh, you know, it runs across my property line. And the whole point of it is, is just to get water to move away, get it into this valley and then move the water to the backside of our property. So this was after a significant amount of work where we moved um, a couple inches of the topsoil up towards our house. So that's why you're actually not seeing grass. I did cut some swales through here um, that kind of split the pollinator habitat from our house. And then we have swales actually running across the property line. That is what it looked like after we got done with the swale management. So it was it's doing its job. It's taking the water and it's moving it to the edges of the property. And again, it was just to keep everything dry. 
Uh, this is all grass. This is all our backyard. You can kind of see I'm standing on my patio here, but um, we were able to, to manage the water and kind of keep it moving to the edges of the property. Got another picture showing the swale. Uh, we did have some trees that were down uh, that I had to manage. Uh, so we threw these in here just to show that there was a, you know, a decent amount of work that went into uh, prepping the property to uh, put the habitat down. Got a burn pile. It's all the trees that we drug out. There's my hives back there. And then this is actually what turned into our, our pollinator habitat. That's a current picture right there. Uh, it's showing that the water management does work. This is our yard. And then you can kind of see the dark area in here. This was actually last year. This was um, after we had a pretty decent amount of rainfall come in after the little bit of a drought that we did have. So you can see the water is actually moving to the sides of the property, which is exactly what I needed to do. So a lot of it was site prep. It was getting, we did have some low spots in this area that we had to take care of. And again, it was moving water to the sides just so we can manage where that, that water was going. I like to take pictures of in the winter. So you're gonna see a few pictures in here just showing what it looks like in the winter. That's the swale getting cut through there. So for the site preparation, what we ended up doing was we used uh, the Bee and Butterfly Habitats Fund gold plan. So they have gold, silver, bronze, and then they have one other one. And the goal of the gold plan is to basically hit these five steps. So you're, you're looking at your site preparation, which is terminating anything that's actively growing. Um, part of the gold plan is, is going, and this is the big one, is getting a soybean uh, planting down prior to actually seeding. And then while the soybeans are growing during the summer season, it's controlling controlling the grass and the and the, the and the weeds and that type of thing. Harvesting the soybeans and then laying the seed down once the temperatures are below 50 degrees and, and that's where they're staying. With us being in the area that we're in, we do have access to farmers. Um, the farmer that actually is disking our property right here was the one that was uh, already farming it. So it was relatively easy for me just to call him up and say, hey, are you going to be on a soybean rotation this year? Which his answer was yes. And I said, okay, would you guys mind, you know, planting the five acres, which absolutely they jumped all over it. Um, typically we lease out the property, but he was actually doing me a favor by doing all the work for me. So I just let him farm the five acres for free. So you can see they're disking up the, the, the property. He had already gone through most of this. There's, there was a pretty decent amount of weeds going through here. And then, you know, my burn pile was out back through here. So he was going through kind of cultivating everything up and, uh, and prepping the, uh, the property for, for the soybeans. That's what the property looked like once the soybeans or the, uh, the, uh, the field was disc. You can actually see our swales in here. Um, so the water runoff, again, is going to the edges of the property. Sorry for the shadow. I was trying to take a picture through a window so I didn't look like a creep. But um, this is them putting the pre-emergent down. I didn't get a picture of them actually seeding the soybeans because uh, we were gone that day. But they were putting the pre-emergent down um, right after planting. This is about June-ish, I want to say. Uh, so you can see the soybeans are actually starting to come up. And then this is towards the end of August. And that's what our field looked like. So it's um, this is you know our five acres all the way back to the woods across here. Um, it was actually, it was, it's clean. There's not a lot of weeds in there. Again, it was managed the way that the, the gold standard uh, tells you to do it. And it's primarily what all farmers do anyways. I couldn't get a daytime pick of the combine, but that's a combine actually uh, going through and, and, and processing and harvesting the soybeans out of there. And then the result of the field was this. So with that gold plan, what the, the goal is with the soybeans is it lays down a nice layer of, it's compost essentially, right? So uh, what happens is, is when you go to seed over this, those seeds are protected. Um, and as long as we can get the seed to the soil, then 
this, the soybean stubble and everything is going to protect it through the winter. So what I was doing here was I was actually going and doing a layout of the property on how I wanted to seed it in this picture. So that's why I snapped it here. So for the habitat installation, what I did was I actually used Google Earth. Um, I didn't use any type of fancy GPS or coordinate system or anything like that. I went to Google. Um, and actually, this is what I did for the application for the, the whole CETA Legacy program. So I found my property, marked the corners, knew I had five acres, and then figured out, okay, I want to do two and a half of the butterfly, and then you got two and a half of the bee mixture. And that's typically what they do um, with the program. It's split 50-50 between the butterfly and the bee. Um, per their recommendation or the requirements, actually, you can't mix them. So you've got the option of splitting the property in half. Um, I chose to do it like this just because I wanted to see the bee mixture on the outside and the butterfly mixture on the inside. It also creates a green break. If I ever decide that I want to do a prescribed burn, um, I can go in here and take care of the butterfly mixture with the per prescribed burn um, and have you know the, uh, the clover and, and everything in the bee mixture uh, kind of preventing that that fire from spreading. So I didn't use anything fancy. I actually plugged, you can kind of see here this northwest corner, uh, the southwest. I plugged all the corners into Google Earth, which was connected to my phone. I physically went out to my field with my phone in my hand, and I walked until I got as close enough to the corner, and then I put a little snow stake down, and I did that for all four corners. So the thought process with um, laying the seed down was this specifically for me. Uh, they have guidelines on how, depending on what equipment you're gonna use, and I'll show you some pictures of the equipment that I use to seed. Um, but I was very nervous when you're looking at the, I guess the amount of seed that you have per acreage. So you're looking at a five acre parcel and I have 25 pounds of seed, um, it's not a lot. So it freaked me out a bit. And what I planned on doing was uh, actually zigzagging and that's exactly what I did. So with the honeybee mixture on the perimeter of the field, I started in the corner and I basically dragged it across. And what I was doing is I was broadcasting it out at a very, very low rate. Uh, there is a method that where you can put a tarp down and, and drive across the tarp and count how many seeds are in a square foot, uh, but I didn't have time to do that. So uh, my goal was, was just to go in and be able to, to, to cross seed everything. So that's kind of what this diagram is showing. I had four 15 pounds of seed for the honeybee mixture over two and a half acres, and I had a shy over 10 pounds for the butterfly mixture, 10 pounds of seed is not a lot. So it's very um, intimidating when you're going to seed uh, two and a half acres having that little seed. So I wanted to make sure that I was not gonna run out and that's, that's kind of what I did, what I did here. This is actually looking at, um, I wanna see this is the bee mixture. So, they, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund include the seeds mixed in with rice hulls, and that's primarily what you're seeing here. And that's just to bulk up the seed mixture. Um, if you were to actually physically look at like clover seed and anything else, it's tiny, like super, super tiny. So they mix it in with the, uh, the rice hulls, so it's, it, it spreads out a little bit easier and it's a little bit easier to manage. So this is going to be specific to Michigan. Um, if you're out of state, it's going to be a little bit different for you. But for the bee mixture, um, you can see it's real heavy on the clover. Uh, you do have some black eyed Susan in there. You have the phacelia that's in there. And then you do have some um, prairie grass, which is the sedges that are in there. There is a significantly more amount of seed that's in the butterfly mixture. So you're looking at uh, blanket flowers, milkweeds, um, sunflowers, cone flowers. Um, there's, there's just a ton of stuff in there. I mean, there's goldenrod. And if you're a beekeeper, you know how valuable goldenrod is in the fall for bees. So there's different variations of goldenrod in there. Uh, so it's just loaded with a bunch of seed. 
And the the nice thing about the mixture is, is they 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 do it so if you have a dry season, there's still stuff that's coming up. And if you have a wet season, there's still stuff coming up. So there's swamp milkweed that's in there along with common milkweed. Um, and actually we're only in the second year. So I haven't seen the bulk of this stuff come in yet, which I'm sure Elsa will go through. But, um, you know, all these different varieties, I, I can look out my field right now and I have a, a few pictures of it to show there's most of the stuff's not in yet. So I'm, I'm anxiously waiting for it. So my intent with seeding initially was to go with a no-till drill. So in Michigan, um, specifically in our area, the Blue Water Conservation District up near Port Huron rents out a no-till drill. So all I had to do was call them and say, hey, I want to rent the drill. They asked me when I needed it, told them a time frame. It was a couple hundred bucks. They delivered it right to our house. Um, and I had it for the duration that I needed it. The nice thing with the drill is that if you have a tractor that's got power beyond with the hydros in the back, is it's all pre-done. It'll, you can run right over the soybean stubble. It'll plant it at the depth that you needed to plant it at. It's just very, very convenient to do. Um, unfortunately, what ended up happening for us was um, Michigan gave us a, a beautiful little snowstorm about a week before we decided to seed. So what you're seeing here is a picture where I actually had everything hooked up. I had the seed in the hopper. This was either before, right before or right after Thanksgiving. Um, and it was about a week after that snow came. So we had about seven or eight inches that were on the ground that melted off. And you can already see the tractors filling up with, with, with litter here. I mean, the tires on the drill were filled with litter. So in an attempt to make this work, I did drag this thing about hundred feet and um, it, it failed. So I actually uh, I had to go in and vacuum out the seed from the hopper. So you can kind of see, I got the hopper here and our little bulkhead shop vac. I was sucking the seed out. Down in here, you can see the actual discs themselves were just filled with stubble from the soybeans. It took me about, I think about an hour and a half to clean that out. So it just wasn't physical, physically possible to do it. And I was on kind of a time frame with getting this with the seed down. So I had to resort to a three point spreader, which we own. So that's what this is showing here. So once I pulled the seed out, dropped it in the three point spreader. Again, this was more or less a gauge. I didn't throw a tarp down and measure to see how many seeds were coming out in a square foot. So I just dialed down the, uh, the rate on the spreader and, and started zigzagging back and forth. So my wife happened to catch me out there uh, on the tractor laying the seed. This is a drone uh, picture that I just took uh, last, well, what, what, two or three days ago. Um, you can actually see, physically see the, the bee mixture and the butterfly mixture. So. My, my Google Earth and walking around with my phone putting stakes down actually did work. Um, interior here, this is all the, the butterfly mixture. And then on the exterior here, this is all the bee mixture. So it worked out, it worked out very, very well. Um, I was actually really, really happy with the way that the three-point spreader worked. If I were to do it again, I probably would not have spent the money on the no-till drill and I would just have gone with, with, with the spreader. This is the winter after we seeded. Again, I like taking winter pictures. So um, seeds just kind of bedded down underneath the snow. The nice thing about the snow is it does create a little bit of a pack, helping push that seed down. If some of those seeds were floating on top of that soybean stubble, um, it was able to actually push it down and get contact with the, uh, with the soil. Got another winter picture. So we're getting into the 2021 growing season. So we ended up seeding the field um, the fall of, of 2020. So we're looking at spring of, of 2021 and you're starting to see some growth. Now, some of this is weeds. Um, again, I'm not a, a botanical expert, so I don't know the difference between a weed and what else is coming up. I know there was clover uh, coming in. There's some clover here, uh, but primarily this is what our field looked like in the spring the following year. 
So now we're looking at June of 2021. Um, we're getting a little bit of grass thrown in there. There was some ragweed coming up. I mean, we, we did have weeds out here are just nuts. Uh, they grow. They gr I mean, even with the dry conditions that we have right now, we've got weeds growing out there. So um, the weeds were a, a, a big, big issue. It was a concern for me, which I did reach out to Elsa and just ask what I needed to do. And pretty much it was just let it let it ride. And if we need to do some maintenance down the road, that's what we're going to do. And that's that's what we ended up doing. So the first signs of life started coming in June. Uh, what you're looking at is crimson clover here. The stuff was beautiful. It was all over. And then the deer were all over. So uh, we had deer coming out nightly, pretty much mowing these things down. So the flowers, I, I snapped a picture of these because um, the flowers were were pretty much gone once the uh, the deer got to them. But we were starting to see signs of life in June. Another shot, um, the Coreopsis here. Uh, we have, you know, blanket flower here. And then um, we're starting to see something come through, which was actually giving me a little bit of hope that we'd, we'd see something again this summer in 2021 was very dry. So we had gone five, six weeks without having any rain. But the, the prayer was still actually prevailing. It was, it was showing some signs of life. So we ended up getting rain. And this was actually the end of the month. So it was a couple, you're talking a couple weeks from going from this to this. So the, uh, the facelia that's here um, is part of the bee mixture in my bees were all over this stuff. It was gorgeous. It was all over our bee mixture. Um, we had butterflies and there was just a ton of wildlife that was, was starting to show up. We were getting birds. Uh, so that rain definitely, definitely helped us. And then you can see a, a swallowtail that was out there. He's, he's got his uh, little straw thing or whatever into uh, uh, you know some clover that was starting to show up. The clover was not real heavy this year um, or in 2021, um, but it did start showing some signs. And again, it did help my hives out with a little bit that did show. Again, we're getting into uh, July and this is actually the butterfly mixture. You're starting to see some of the black eyed Susans pop up. Again, you got the blanket flower popping up, um, you know, uh, the gardelia that was popping up. There's a native bee on it that's actually not a honeybee down there. So we, we were starting to see some of the butterfly mixture come through. So for maintenance on the first year, the goal is to keep the weeds down. Um, what the guidelines in the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund tell you to do is once you get your weeds up to about 16 inches, you wanna knock you know, two, three, four inches off the top of them just to keep them from seeding. So again, I have a brush hog. Um, I actually bought the brush hog specifically for the prairie, um, but I need it for other areas too. So it was beneficial in those areas. But what I ended up doing was I actually had to go through and, and cut. Um, and it kind of hurt because we, you can kind of see here, I mean, we, we had black eyed Susans popping up. Uh, there was other flowers that were actually out in the butterfly mixture and I was gonna lob everything off. Um, so it was a little bit hard to do, but again, it was, it was for, uh, the benefit of the prey and it, it definitely benefited us for this year. There's just another image showing exactly what I was going through. Uh, this is all trimmed and cut down and the goal with the height is to try to keep the amount of litter um, being chopped and blown all over from being too thick where the the plants are not getting the light and not getting the stimulation from the water and the sun. So they recommend about 16 inches, lobbing about four inches off, back down to a foot, just to keep everything kind of clean, uh, where you don't get a lot of that that mulch and whatever, you know, uh, covering the, the plants. So now we're getting into the 2022 growing season. This was late April. Um, this is the butterfly mixture, and you can see the butterfly mixture, or the, sorry, this is the bee mixture. Uh, you can see it, it came in phenomenal. Um, this is all clover. Uh, we were really, really happy with, with the results of, of the bee mixture. You can see the line 
where we have the bee and butterfly mixture split. You can see my hives back there. So the bees had access to this clover, I mean, right outside their doorstep. And then here's June. Two and a half acres of our field looked just like this. It was gorgeous. Um, it was just completely filled with clover. And I was, again, I was very, very worried last year of what this would look like. And then this year, it, it just was, it was phenomenal. Even in the butterfly mixture, we started to see um, plants emerge. Honestly, I couldn't tell you what these are. I'd have to look at a plant app, but you go out there and it's just, there's, there's flowers and things popping up. You know, this is another shot of the clover here. That was a couple of weeks ago. That's all that Indian blanket and two and a half acres is filled with that. You can see, we actually even have some sunflowers starting to pop up through here. Uh, some of the taller ones here. So like our two and a half acres of the butterfly mixture are just completely covered in this, in this flower. This is the uh, bee mixture. Now you're, it's, I'm not really catching at the end here. The clover, we started off with white clover and that started to die off. And then the red clover started to take over. And now that has died off but you can see the black-eyed Susans. We have bunches of black-eyed Susans all over our field um, that look just like this. And then this is another shot of the, uh, the butterfly mixture down here in the lower corner. And that right there, I mean, is just what our field looks like. We do have, you know, some of this is like a, a native weed that's coming up. I think it's called fleabane. Um, and from research on what that is, is um, it's one of the first native plants to start popping up when uh, habitat goes back to its natural resource. Um, so it's actually kind of nice to see. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's beautiful out there. And uh, it, it's, it's just been a really, really great experience watching the last two years and, and just seeing how it benefits my bees. And um, I'm very much looking forward to what happens next year because uh, Again, I, I think it's the three to four year mark is when the, the butterfly mixture is really supposed to start, you know, start popping. So it's, it's something that we're looking forward to next year. And then with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elsa. So I do want to uh, thank Jeremy and, and Anna for putting together this program and inviting me here to talk with you tonight. Pretty neat, neat uh, when you get a cooperator like Jeremy that's so excited about doing his project and doing it well. Um, he's had so much success and we just love to see it. It, uh, it makes us happy um, in our program. That's exactly what we want to see. And so I'm going to go through a little bit about what the Seed Legacy program is for you tonight and give you some ideas about ways that you could use the program, e even if you can't use it in your uh, five acres or your two acres in the backyard. Um, there, there's other ways that you could use the program. So I'm kind of just going to start with uh, Something that you all know, um, you know, bees are in dire straits. Uh, they need our help, uh, honeybees and native bees. And we're trying to do the best we can to create habitat uh, for pollinators. And, and it, it, for us, it's not just bees, but that's kind of our why. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our why at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. But we like to kind of say that we are um, the greatest pollinator program that you have never heard of. Uh, we are we are a super secret diner in the middle of nowhere that uh, only the locals know about, um, and we want to change that. We absolutely want to be doing more programs. So, um, so I want to talk to you about how you can get a program going in your property, how you can think about doing other programs, and and a little bit about why we started the uh, Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. For us, we're really concerned about bee populations. We are really concerned about monarch butterflies. Um, but you look at uh, honeybees and the managed losses, um, it's an annual 40 to 50% loss of, you know, your beehives. So I don't, it's not a very sustainable, beekeeping is not a very sustainable program for many. Um, there's a lot of losses when you're a beekeeper. And so, 
that's that's uh, been an issue for us. We've been concerned about it. We've been concerned about populations of um, monarch butterflies as well. Uh, you you may or may not know that in December of 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, listed the monarch butterfly as warranted but precluded, which you know that maybe initially doesn't uh, sound like something you know too much about, but <laughs> but warranted means that it, it should be listed. Um, the monarch butterfly should be listed as an endangered species, but there's many more that are more critical than the monarch butterfly. So um, that's been a real concern for us in as wildlife biologists at being Butterfly Fund and researchers and um, beekeepers. You know, we're very concerned about these uh, neg negative things we're seeing in the populations. So um, as you see, the monarch butterfly trends look a lot like the trends that you see in the honeybees. Um, you know, we've lost 80 to 90 percent of the monarch butterflies since um, the 70s. So we're seeing declines that we're really concerned about not being able to um, to be able to mitigate. So for us, trying to create habitat for these species is where we want to spend our careers and we want to spend our time doing that. Um, and it's not just about bees and butterflies and pollinators. Um, you take a look at some of the most common but threatened or um, or declining, kind of most common species in decline. And you look at the uh, northern bobwhite quail, um, almost 80% of population loss uh, since the 70s for bobwhite quail. Uh, we're just seeing a lot of bird losses as well. And grassland birds, grassland and shrubland birds are taking the, the brunt of it. They are really declining. So what we decided to do as a bee and butterfly habitat fund was come up with a program and we call it the Seed a Legacy Program. And it's a program designed to create more habitat for pollinators, for songbirds, and for other wildlife. And uh, so it's a, a program where we really work with you to um, try and get this high quality pollinator habitat on the landscape. We provide free seed mixtures. We work with projects that are two acres or larger. Now, if you say I don't have two acres, but I've got one and my neighbor has one, that counts for two for us. We're happy to do something like that. Um, but we don't um, we don't deal in, in backyard plantings, you know, small plantings. There's many other people that fill that niche. So that's just not one that we focus on. We focus on um, sizes of two acres to 25 acres, get our uh, free seed mixtures. It's open to private, public, and corporate land. And you can read that to be any land. Um, we'll work with anybody. As long as there's going to be a good pollinator outcome, we will work with you on a project. Our online application process is fairly simple. You have to download a few pictures and um, get some coordinates of the site uh, so that we know where it's located. But other than that, it's a real simple process. And then we provide you one-on-one -on -one technical guidance with a biologist to talk you through your planting, to talk you through management, and to provide you with what you need to make it a successful project like Jeremy's. We always plant the mixes in two separate pieces like Jeremy talked about. And this is key and critical to us. Um, if you were to mix the honeybee mix with the monarch butterfly mix, so the native mix with the uh, introduced clover mix, what you would end up having is after four or five years, those clovers would take over that site and you would end up with a site that was mostly clovers. Uh, the native plants need more time to establish. They need more elbow room to establish and they can't kind of fend off the aggressiveness of the clover mix. So we always uh, encourage you to plant them in two different pieces. This is what uh, Jeremy was showing you, real similar. This is Phacelia with some crimson, crimson clover. Uh, this is what it looks like in two to three months. Establishes very quickly that half of the mix. Now, the higher quality, um, more native mix, in, in Michigan, your mix is 54 species. As you saw, um, Jeremy's seed tag there. Uh, we have a lot of native species in Michigan, and, and some will do well in a dry year, some will do well in a wet year. 
but we try and keep that number very high uh, so that there will be available resources for pollinators throughout the entire growing season. Uh, it's real critical to have the early bloomers and real critical, as Jeremy said, with the goldenrod to have late bloomers as well. So we focus a lot on those two ends of the spectrum. Um, the middle of the growing season, you know, June, July, that a lot of things grow then. So we aren't, it isn't as critical for us to, to really pick uh, those species. We, we do, I mean, we, we pick really great pollinator species, but um, we try real hard to focus on both ends of the spectrum, the early and the late season. So we work um, on these projects, you know, it, we provide multiple benefits. Uh, you know, the landowner enjoys the project. Uh, visually, they're stunning um, after year three, usually. Uh, year one, it uh, creeps. Year two, it leaps. Uh, well, year, year, year one, it sleeps, I'm sorry. So we got the sleeping year the first year, and then it creeps. And then that third year, it leaps. And you're seeing pictures like this. Um, so you got to uh, be in it for the long haul, but you know, the benefits to all the different wildlife species and the benefits to uh, soil health, um, it's, it's a really big one. And just think about how many native species uh, of bees that you're probably producing on that site. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Now, one of our uh, founders of the Bee and Butterfly Habit Habitat Fund is Zach Browning of Browning's Honey. He's one of the larger commercial beekeepers in the United States. And he has these sites um, around his bee yards. He's done these plantings, these two acre plantings. And he says it's uh, absolutely the best thing he's ever done for his bees. Um, and I've seen it in person on his site. I actually kicked up a pheasant and a brood of pheasant chicks on one of his uh, honeybee uh, halves of, the, of his planting on one of his sites in North Dakota. So uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of benefits to the beekeepers. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the research that's going on on these plantings. Um, USGS, uh, US Geological Services, was contracted by USDA to do a research project to look at bee use of um, different plantings. So from top to bottom, it's going to be the same way in the next three slides. Um, they looked at roadsides, pastures, um, other grasslands, National Wildlife Refuge. They looked at CRP or Conservation Reserve Program plantings. And then they looked at the bee and butterfly habitat plantings. And what we found was that we had twice as many flowers per transect as the next closest, um, which was CRP. So that was a lot of flowers for each of our transects. Now the honeybee flower visits by each land use type, our honeybees, you know, we saw almost, almost three times, um, well, a little bit more than three times actually, the honeybee flower visits by each land use type uh, on the bee and butterfly habitat projects. And then the last one, which I really find interesting because I'm, I'm a native bee lover as well, is that we had almost eight times more native bee visits on our site than we did on the other sites, on CRP or any of the other sites. It's just a really incredible thing to me that we're also producing this great habitat for native bees. Um, and when they ended up doing the research right in the paper, which is out there now, it's in public, um, what they said was, you know, if it could all be bee and butterfly engineered seed mixes like what we've got. We've engineered these seed mixes to be beneficial for pollinators on purpose. Um, if it could all be like that, um, we, we would be doing great. But the problem is we have so few acres of bee and butterfly habitat projects on the ground um, because we're not a program like CRP that has 30 million acres. We're young and, and up and coming, um, but we don't have 30 million acres. Um, now, just think about if CRP actually used our seed mixes and we could get those seed mixes into uh, CRP programs. We think about that a lot. So, so here's where we work kind of on the landscape. If you look at this, this is the uh, where most uh, monarch butterflies are actually uh, raised in the US, um, the red areas, you know, so, so this has kind of helped us 
inform where we develop the Seed a Legacy program. And so we're in 12 states. We started with two. I believe we went to six. Then we went to 10. Now we're at 12. So we are in 12 states right now. Um, and we want to grow more. We will. It's just uh, we want to do it on purpose. And we want to be very strategic about where we grow our programs. We want to make sure we have the support there to uh, fund the projects to actually get good quality projects on the ground. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about opportunities for collaboration. If you're thinking, you know, I could do this on my place, that's great. We'll sign you up. <laughs> we, our uh, fall applications are due by September 1st, and we'd love to sign you up for a project. But if you're not, uh, maybe you're not thinking that that would work for you, but maybe you know other folks. So here are some ideas. We have the private landowners, like we have uh, this gentleman raises queens. So he's a beekeeper in uh, Minnesota, Ottertail County. Mark Sunberg, and he's done a wonderful project. He also used the gold plan with the soybean prep for the field, and you can see how that is, um, how his site's done. Um, we also work with agriculture, and we work in uh, filter strips or buffers, uh, you know, for folks that are interested in doing that, or along the barn, uh, along the homestead. Renewable energy is a big thing for us and kind of an up-and-coming arena for the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Our two Seed mixtures just make so much sense for this. You know, putting in the lower growing clover mixture underneath the panels where they won't grow as high, and then planting the more native, um, more diverse, taller mix outside the panel area. Um, we've got 17 states now. We provide technical guidance and free or discounted seed depending on the project. And we go from small projects um, outside of a farm to really larger utility scale projects. We're doing a corporate campus in Iowa um, and planted this whole area. It's gonna uh, shade up for you there. Planted that whole area this, this uh, last fall. They planted it in November and had the entire team from their, from their work team come out and everybody planted individual pieces of it. Uh, it was pretty, pretty neat for a team building project and it's gonna be gorgeous in the future. A uh, wastewater treatment plant, uh, Shelby County, Ohio, uh, they actually got just declared a bee city and they have planted a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so pretty neat project. The FSA kids came in and actually did the soybeans, did that site prep. So it was uh, kind of a neat deal. Uh, and we work with wildlife management areas in a lot of different states and even some uh, fish and wildlife service properties. Uh, utility rights away, those are also great for, for the two seed mixtures. Uh, city parks, hike, bike trails, we are working on a lot of those. And uh, we work with our partners at, at Monarch Joint Venture. That's uh, one group that we work very closely with to identify projects and work with their biologists to help us uh, spread the word about the program a little bit more. And so you're asking at this point, like, what can I do? Uh, the biggest thing we want you to do is promote the project. Um, let us know if you've got a neighbor or if you're interested or your city might be interested or, you know, you've got a utility that might be interested. Uh, you could co-host a pollinator webinar like this one. We're happy to work with you. Um, Anna and Jeremy did a great job setting this up and inviting us. We're happy to set up those for a group. Uh, we have flyers and we'd be happy to hand them out to you, send you a, a stack of them that you can uh, share with your beekeeping club or uh, your garden club or, you know, wherever you might be that you might be able to spread the word. Um, we have a program called a gift, Gifts That Grow. Um, and that's a kind of a neat one that you can, uh, instead of giving somebody a $50 bouquet for their birthday, you can donate uh, to the Gifts That Grow program. And then it turns within six months, it turns into actual habitat on the ground like Jeremy's project. So that one's a, a neat one as well. And then just following us on social media. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we have a, a new employee starting here real quick, and she's going to be working on a lot of that for us. So uh, that's, those are some things that you can do to help us. And, and I'm going to show you one more thing that we've got that will help you. Um, we have an establishment, uh, Pollinator Habitat Establishment Management Guide that is free. 
It is online. It's about 45 or so pages, but it takes you through step by step how you can do a project on your own. Um, answers a lot of questions. It's available online. You can download it, print it off if you'd like to, or just, uh, you know, read it off the internet. So we're happy for you to use that and share it and use it any way you can. If it's got a good pollinator outcome, we want to be a part of it. and We're happy to help you, whether you use our program or not. So we, uh, I'm just wanted to leave this up here for a little bit, bit as uh, as Anna comes back on and, and we'll be answering some questions, but here's how you would contact us. Um, you can, that's my personal cell number there. You can call me, text, uh, or email. And like I said, our applications for the fall are due by September 1st. So we'll be making decisions about which projects we're gonna get in this fall soon after that. So we're happy to, to see your name come across our desk at any time.